I often get questions about the commentaries and the resources, even the books that I read. How do I know it's a good author? And to be honest, I don't always know. But today I'm gonna take you along to a bookstore and we can shop together and talk about all the things. Let's begin. So Texas has gotten a cold front and I kind of love it because I finally get to like bundle up and pretend like it's cold outside. I mean, it's cold, but it's not like that cold. But I get to wear my cute little coat and pretend like it's really fall, even though now it's like literally November. And I think honestly, the cold gave me the inspiration to want to go to a cozy bookstore and peruse the aisles for a new book to read or new resources to use in my Bible studies. And of course, y'all know I'm a penny pincher. So of course we'll be getting used books. And lately I've been shopping at Half Price Books. So they like you to bring a reusable bag. I got that. I'm gonna grab my water. Gotta stay hydrated. I recently gave away one of these on my Patreon page because I've just been really enjoying it. And I was like, let me share the joy. But it really does help me to stay hydrated, to drink out of the dorky, cute cups. I'm that girl. Anyway, let's go. I love a good bookstore, but I do have to know in our post-Christian era, it's really weird going into secular bookstores and looking for quality Christian reading because you have a bigger Christian fiction, which I just don't read, and then actually like Christianity commentaries, Bible study resources, a whole wall of Christian living, which is like how to mourn, how to think about praying, like the broad scope of Christian books, and then like a tiny little area of Bible study resources, Bibles, etc. And it was right next to the religion section so you had literally books on witchcraft next to a verse mapping bible it's so disorienting the fact that culturally we would even group those together as in similar sections of the bookstore blows my mind but anyway this is my corner of the store where i like to hunker down and it's kind of like thrifting i assume 95 percent of the stuff is stuff i'm not going to be interested in and i'm here for the little golden nuggets that i have to dig for for me, because I'm eternally trying to grow my commentary stash, I first look at the sets of commentaries that they're selling. These would be donated or sold to the store by previous pastors and they often have like the pastor's church or name in it and I love it. But anyway, the sets are really valuable because then you don't have to hunt down every single volume of that volume set. You bought a big chunk of it. But obviously that's assuming that you like the commentary set. And so if you're not used to the commentaries and you just know you want more commentaries in your library, this is the great opportunity that you have to sit down and scan through the commentaries. I just look at like my favorite passages that I know super well and I'm like, what do they say about John 4? Are they adding anything that I've never heard before or great cultural information that makes more sense to me? Are they using a lot of resources? I love me some commentaries that have a ton of footnotes because typically that means that they've done their research. They've read other people. They're responding to other people. They're building off of what other people have said and kind of in this ongoing communication with the guild. I want to read those people. I want to read their conversations. So-and-so says this, but I say this. That's what I care about personally because I want to know what the debates are. I want to know what scholars are asking and answering and join in with those conversations myself and my own Bible studies. Now, I recognize these commentaries probably from a pastor's office and I've been studying Isaiah, so I immediately pulled them off the shelves and started inspecting them, looking at those footnotes, like I said, and really just double checking, is this what I think it is? Is this somebody I want to read? And I quickly can see, yeah, he taught at Westminster Seminary. That's a great seminary that's produced a lot of great scholarship. So it's probably a commentary I'll really enjoy. So now I'm going to look at the formatting of it and flipping through what's the general just outline of the commentary. Now they are paperback, not hardcover, which is not ideal for resource that I want to keep for years. But I liked what I saw and it was a good deal. A set of three on Amazon is over $100. So I set it aside to maybe possibly buy. Moving on from commentaries, I also just scan for just general Bible study resources. And this can be super hit or miss. These are going to be resources like atlases, Bible dictionaries. I did see a few that I recognized, maybe older editions. And found a couple interesting items like this interlinear Bible that had the NIV and KJV, which would be a cool resource if we didn't have so many free ones on online like Bible Hub, as well as this atlas. Actually, I wouldn't even classify it as an atlas, but that's the section that I found it in, so we'll just go with that. <laughs> At first glance, this looks really cool, but there's no citations, no verse references. 
not a lot of sources when you really got into it and started reading not a ton of actual meat in it it was a lot of pictures art summaries of passages but not any like cross references footnotes it didn't lead to further scholarship it just kind of simplified stuff for maybe like a beginner it could make maybe like a cool coffee table book we have a lot of bibles and study bibles i found another resource it looked like dispensationalism so i just put it back and that was just by like the trigger language eras and dividing the, the bible storyline i'm more of a covenant theologian and so i wanted to veer away from that but then there's also a section that i totally avoid if i'm just being honest with you guys and it is anything eschatological i'm not going to just pick up a book on the end times from like a random person I've never heard of from a used bookstore. Speaking to you like I would talk to my sister, just frankly, a lot of times that's where the weirdo theology taking scripture out of context kind of camps out. And so if I'm going to buy anything on Revelation or any kind of eschatological theology, it's going to be from a scholar that I know, respect, already know a good bit about the book, and I just probably order it. Now, this one did catch my eye. I recognized the name as something that I've seen in footnotes of commentaries and such, but was really torn about it because it's a different type of resource than I have. Here, I'm making sure I know who wrote this, Bullinger. Um, it's endorsed by the Dean of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. So, okay, I kind of am able to get some ideas here. Flip to the back. Okay, he's an Anglican, kind of getting some ideas of how theology might impact like I definitely wouldn't want to read this if this was written by like a non-believer critic of the Bible who just wants to take any pivotal statement in the Bible and make it a metaphor. This is when you want to consider the type of literature you're looking at and who's writing it and from what angle or biases they may be writing from just to take it all in consideration. And obviously Christian living is a lot easier because it's all kind of grouped together by author. And look who came while I was looking at Christian living. I'd like to read you up and down. <laughs> What's your advice for finding a good book? scan the shelves, look around, reach the high spots. The first thing I look for is authors that I recognize. That's how I found God of All Things by Andrew Wilson was because Jen Wilkin endorsed it. So that can usually be a really good way is like who's endorsing this book, but also who's like referencing this book um, and what does this book reference? You can look in the footnote notes of the book and see who they're using. Are they using a lot of Wesley? Are they using a lot of Luther, Calvin? You know, you can kind of get a vibe there as well. So I actually just found this book because Eric McTaxis is one of my favorite writers and one of my favorite books is his on Bonhoeffer. And so I saw his name and I saw this was on Martin Luther. And I've seen this one before. So I'm like, hey, I love the way he writes. This is on Martin Luther. I might as well pick it up because I know that I'll enjoy it. You might also see something like this and be like, oh, I like the book of Revelation. What if you look closely? Doctrine and Covenants, the DNC. That's a Mormon lingo. And just to confirm, I looked and we got Brigham Young University. So immediately, you know, this is from a Mormon point of view, which they added to the scriptures. This is cult literature and they mix it in here with Christian literature. And you might at first glance think it's about revelation, right? So there's, again, why it's so important to just kind of get a vibe of where they're from and who they're talking to and about. Or even those who have walked away from the faith, like Rob Bell, thrown into the Christian section. Fun times. But that's why I love shopping with my husband, just another person to bounce ideas off. He might know things about authors that I don't. But I say all of this not to stress you out or make you fearful. I'll talk more about this in a second. But first, we needed to check out and head out of the store. Okay, like I said, I knew I wanted to get these right off the bat because I'm already studying these and it will be a long-term resource just to keep, there's a hair, as a resource to use in the future for Bible studies. Now it's not the whole book. There's still another one. Yeah, one of these, finish off Isaiah, but it's a great resource. I already have some in this set. So this is gonna be something I'll definitely use like today. Now, y'all saw Joe picked out this because not only is Luther a hero of his, but he also really likes Eric Metaxas. We've heard him speak in real life. Great speaker, great author. And so this is something that he will be reading. And then finally, I did end up getting this. Figures of speech used in the Bible. And I'm of course going to take the cover off. One, because it's destroyed and outdated, 
but also two because it's a beautiful hardcover. My biggest fear though is while this is a great resource, I'm afraid I'm going to forget to use it and to look things up. So that's sometimes the hardest thing with these odd end resources that I just pick up used is sometimes I forget I have them because I didn't like intentionally save up for them. And so this is my one concern is like I don't have resources just on figures of speech and yet this is a great resource for that. Like, oh, is that a figure of speech or does oh, really does Bollinger think this is a figure of speech? Let me go check. That's going to be when I use this is just to see if he agrees with whoever else I'm reading or what I think and his two cents on what type of figure of speech it is and why they used it. And that's what's really cool is he has all the different references of an idiom, all the different references of a Hebrew homonym of a pro diorsos. I don't know what that is. Or an eroticus. This would actually genuinely be really fun to read from cover to cover if I had all the time in the world. I don't know if I will do that, but for sure it's a great resource to have because I love figures of speech and studying like the literary elements in a passage always takes it deeper for me because there's a reason why they're there, right? So I'm glad I got this. It was $20, so not the cheapest thing to buy just in case, but I think it could really come in handy. I apologize for the lighting. I don't know who allowed me to be a YouTuber. Okay, hey guys. I just picked up goodies from our favorite little bakery. We love their Chex Mix that's gluten-free. And then they made gluten-free, dairy-free cupcakes. So Joe wanted, he had to go pick up the boys from school, but he wanted a whoopie, which is like a little cookie sandwich. And I got the boys little pumpkin cookies. Let's see. I just use hand sanitizer, so don't worry, I'm not getting them dirty. <laughs> but little pumpkin cookies, an after school sugar high, nothing like it. And I got, I gotta show you, this is a gluten free, dairy free, I think it's like everything but eggs are in it. Vanilla cupcake with strawberry icing. I can never find allergy friendly food. So good. Joe could tell I was like running low on sugar and just tired because he was like, go to the bakery and go get something and you're brain dead. I guess while I sit here and digest that wonderful cupcake, I should probably mention that I don't share all of this trying to act like I know everything or my opinion is the ultimate be all like don't read this person, do read this person kind of thing. I share all of this so that you can go on the journey of learning as well without being limited by fear because that's one of the biggest things I see in Christian culture today is Christians are so afraid of reading the bad guys. And while spiritual warfare is a very real thing, the spiritual warfare is a lot deeper than just like, I'm going to get a demon by picking up the wrong book by the wrong person. Person, but rather it's more so like oh I'm going to just accept something anything that this person says just because I admire them and we have to use discernment and continually measure up what we're reading to scripture and so no matter who you're reading just continually ask yourself do I think this is faithful to scripture always hold everything I say everything anybody says up to the fire never completely accept everything that anybody says because we aren't inerrant right other authors other commentators other people aren't inerrant, but the word of God is. And I want you to be able to feel confident walking into the bookstore, knowing that you don't know everything, just like Joe and I, but using discernment on who do you want to spend your time reading or your money buying. But you'll always be doing that wrong if you're like, hands down, I can always trust what this person says because you always want to be challenging. Wait, is that truly faithful to scriptures? And then checking in the word because that's how you learn. You go deeper in your knowledge. But then two, we don't want to be lazy Christians. We don't want to just accept stuff because Andy Stanley or Chuck Swindoll said it. We want to believe it's true because we see it displayed throughout scripture. That's what I love to do with my resources is measure them up to each other. Oh, this one says this, this one says that. Earlier this week, I was studying a psalm. One commentary said, this psalm is a lament. And the next commentary said, oh no, this psalm is a praise psalm. And I was like, well, what is it then? Lament or praise? The more I read both of their arguments, the more I was able to see, oh yeah, there's elements of both in this psalm. And that directly enhanced my theological understanding understanding of the psalm to better understand the lament parts in this psalm and form the praise. It took my entire knowledge deeper because I wasn't just reading one person what they said, but I was comparing all these different people and what they say about this passage. So that's what I want you guys to do is to do your due diligence. Your theology is worth fighting for. The way you think about God and his word is worth studying for. And this spiritual investment of reading a lot of people's points of views, reading a lot of people and the way that they see stuff is always going to be edified 
edifying, always going to grow you spiritually. It's never going to be a waste. But you know what will be a waste? The things that we do just out of habit, like watching TV or scrolling on social media. Those things are a waste of time a lot of the time. That's why I kind of wanted to take y'all on this journey, not only because it's a change of scene and things like that, also to push the buttons. It's I'm not ever probably going to be the person that's like, only read people from this denomination, only read this translation, only do it this way. Sorry, I just remembered the back of my car is messy. Just ignore that. But like, I'm never going to tell you guys just to do things the certain way because I know that when I read people out of my tradition, when I expand my horizons and I'm challenged by an Anglican, I learn so much more than if I just was like, oh no, I don't read any of them. Oh, I don't read the Wesleyans. Oh, I don't read whatever. But it's when I read Wesley, I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of, that's like cool. That's interesting. I'll take that, but I'll leave that. Whatever it is. And that is true studenthood. That is true growing in the word and your knowledge of the word is being able to read and discern truth from lies or truth from distorted truth. But you're never going to learn how to do that until you start taking those baby steps. Now, if you are a baby Christian, now's not the time. Five years from now, maybe. Or even two years from now. But we have so many illiterate, like biblically illiterate, lazy Christians in our day and age that aren't willing to do the hard work or just don't want to. And there's so much life there in knowing what you believe and why you believe it. So if you get anything from this video, get that. In the meantime, I'm going to go take these cookies to some well-deserving little boys. I got you a pumpkin cookie. Pumpkin cookie.